Guys, how do you ever look it up? Alright, John, you got to throw it. Max, pick it up. Emma, sit back. Thank you. All right. All right, guys. So we got a new guy. What's your name, Josh? Josh, are you do you do the area? What's up? No, he's been here. You've been here before? He's old. All right. Well, high five, brother. Glad you're here. Yeah. And then Egan, this is his first. You guys, you you know him. This is his first night here. This year, but he's been here before, right? You guys know Egan, right? Yeah. And you guys know Max. So you a couple. Know Max. We yeah. all know him forever. All right. So a couple <laughs> new faces. So listen, our God is this week. Is God is always at work. So to review, who remembers what our God is and for a point? And by the way, if you're new here, we get points here. You lose a point if you're bad, but if you're good, you get a point for your team. Who remembers our God, what our God is was last week? Science. Patience. 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 That is that is absolutely correct. That is absolutely correct. And and good job, science. Who could not hit this is I'll give two points for this one. Who can say the verse from last week? <laughs> It's not it one right there? Now. No, that's not, this is not it. It's last, this week, last week's verse. Uh, I cannot say it. Though. Nobody. Raya would probably be the one that would say Nobody. Oh, that's sad. Uh, where is Raya? 2 Peter, I saw her at Second Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as uh, some men try slackness, but his long-suffering. And we learn that means patience, right? He's patient to usward. Not only that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, remember? No. I wasn't oh, you weren't here. But there are those guys that were here. So anyway, and we said, listen, if you've come to faith in the 21st century, and, and he wrote that this back in the 1st century, he's been waiting 2,000 years, so he's patient. If God's patient, and we're his children, we want to be like him, we should be patient, right? Remember we talked about that last week, guys? Wow. Okay. Maybe we'll review that. A little more next week. Not All right. All right. We'll do a review week next week, though. So we'll get it. All right. So let's move on to this week, then. All right. Maybe we'll, we'll get it. We'll get it this week. This, this week, by the way, I don't know if you guys know this. My favorite verse in the Bible is Romans eight twenty eight. This is this is an awesome verse, and we get to look at that this week. The verse goes like this. And we know that all things work together for, for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So let's break this verse down. And, and, and the first thing I noticed, it says, and we know that all things. And it struck me as I was looking at this because it doesn't say all times. And I thought to myself, our theme for this week, according to the Awana material, our theme for this week is God is always at work. Which, so if you're thinking this is the theme, it would say all times. It doesn't. In fact, this verse doesn't say, this verse says God is working in all things. It doesn't say he's working all the time, right? And we know that all things work together for the good, for them that love God. It doesn't say all, all times. So I thought the theme of the week, always at work, probably it would be better written, working in all things. So if I were writing the theme, I would say, and if I were writing a theme for this work, I might put God is working in all things, because that's what the verse says. It doesn't say he's working in all times. And I'm not disputing the fact that he is working at all times. But what I want you guys to be aware of, remember we talked about last week we shouldn't read our inferences into the text. We should pull the, get the author's intent out of the text, right? You guys remember that from last week, right? Mm -hmm. And so I thought this is unfortunate that the Awana material says, well, 
the theme is always at work, but the verse doesn't say always at work. Because that, that kind of sets your mind kind of to be misled. And I don't want you to be misled. Now, God is always at work. I'll grant you that. But that's just not what this verse is saying. So I think a better theme for it would be working in all things. That fits. Always working doesn't necessarily fit. I want you guys to open your Bible, which is Psalm 121. Psalm 121, and we'll read this together. I'll read it out loud. You read it with me in your head. Psalm what? Psalm 121. Psalm 121. Psalm is the middle book of the Bible. If you open the Bible to the middle. Yep, yep, 121. Yeah, you got it. But I'll read it out loud. Read it with me. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. Where does my help come from? Right? So maybe he needs some help. Where's my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. Well, that's a pretty good place to have your help come from. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keeps thee will not slumber. Right? Is that what it says? He that, it? So, yeah. I mean, I mean that's verse 3. So if I wanted to say God is always at work, maybe I would use Psalm 121 verse 3. He that keeps thee will not slumber. Okay? Because I think that speaks to the fact that he doesn't sleep. He's always working, right? But, but uh, 828 doesn't. Okay? So, and then the next verse. Behold, verse 4, he that keepeth Israel shall neither, go ahead, slumber nor sleep. So it says, listen, this guy that where, your, where your help comes from, the God of Israel, he doesn't sleep, he doesn't slumber. Now that says God's always at work, more so than works in all things. So I just want you, I want you to be critical whenever you're reading the text. I don't want you to somebody to tell you that this is what the text says, and then they, 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 they say something it doesn't say, and you say, oh yeah. Don't do that. Always be critical and say, is that really what the text says? My point is, God is always at work. I'm not denying that premise. I'm just saying, Romans 8, 28 doesn't say he's always at work. It says he's working in all things, and they're not the same. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah, yeah. So anyway, and then if you read on, the Lord is thy keeper, the Lord shall, uh, the Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand, the sun shall not spite thee by day, nor the moon by night. That means he's working all the time. He's going to keep the sun from screwing you up at the day, and the moon from screwing you up at the night. So that's night and day. So, that, so Psalm 121 is just talking about God is always at work in your life. So use Psalm 121 if you want to say God is always at work. Don't use Romans 8.28. That's my point. In other words, don't, don't read into the text what's not there. Read into the text what's there. That's so important. And it's so easy to be misled if you're not doing that and to get wrong thinking and wrong theology. That happens. So I wanted to hit that because I was disappointed when I saw a one. I wanted to say always at work, and that's not what the verse is. So anyway, God is, now let me know, God is, and we know that some things work together for good, right? Is that what it says? No. no. What did I do? Mm. Emma? Instead of all things, you said some. I did. So it does not say some. Not some. Because it's easy. Listen, if you want to say God is all, working all things for those that are good, for those that love him, it's easy to say, oh, yeah, well, I guess if I love God, then what? My life should go pretty good then, right? It's easy to fall into that. Some people think that, right? It's easy to think if God's working all things together for the good, then to love God. If I love God, I shouldn't have any more trouble, right? Is that what this verse is saying? No. 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 So, so God is all things. So God is working and making things work for your good in good things and in bad things. Let's do a sword drill. James. James. Chapter 1, James chapter 1, 13 to 14. What? She had her Bible open. Alright, go! James 51? No, chapter 1. I wrote it down. James chapter 1, verses, verses uh, 13 to and 14. Where Joel, no man say when he has Joel got it. Joel, keep your finger there because I'm going to have you say it loud because I want everybody to hear you say it. It's important. Read it again, Joel. 
people. Is that right, Joe? Um, so. Yeah, okay. So, so if God doesn't tempt people, then my, then my thought then, well, then, then, so he's not, he doesn't cause people to sin. So if somebody sins, maybe it's outside of his will. Maybe it's outside of his sovereignty. So if God's working all things for my good, what if somebody does something that's a sin that God didn't tempt, that maybe God, it's, it's outside of God's power, that, that God didn't tempt them to sin? To do that, if so, what if maybe somebody hits you and that's a sin, right? Is God going to work that out for your good if you love Him, mm -hmm. right? Even though God didn't cause that person to do it, is God still sovereign over that? I guess that's the question. So let's look up another verse, Isaiah forty-five seven. Isaiah forty-five seven. Yeah, Isaiah forty-five seven. Go. Isaiah. Yeah, Isaiah. Isaiah what? 48 seconds. 45 seconds. Alright, Joel, round two. Come on, Joel. Everybody listen to Joel. Everybody listen to Joel. Say it loud, Joel. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I the Lord do all these things. I bet you never thought that was in the Bible, right? What's it say? I create evil, right? God talking. Right? So so listen, when somebody sins, it's not because God is tempting them to sin. He doesn't tempt anybody to sin. But it is a part of God's overall plan. He's working in all of that. Because he's whenever it says I create evil, it's saying he's sovereign over it. It's all part of his plan. Even evil things. Let me ask you this. Did you know that? Some people think that's not true. Listen. What was the greatest sin ever done? Delaney. Well, I'm getting the credit for that. That wasn't what I was thinking. But I'm getting the credit for that because that was the first sin. And that, that was the one that kicked things off. Right? I mean. Go ahead. I mean, you might not get good. Uh, well, Joe, I call on you so much. Let's call on Ben. Go ahead, Ben. I like that answer too. That was like Satan. I mean, he's the first Satan whenever he tried to take it over the so kingdom you of put it for girls. Don't you put it for girls. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, yes, I can't believe I did that. So let me, okay, let me tell you what I, what I, what I was thinking. All right, Joe, go ahead. No. So what I, was, what I was thinking is whenever Jesus was crucified, cru crucifying the Son of God. I thought we'd rank up there. Even though you guys gave some good answers too, and I don't really know which one is technically the worst, but that's what I thought. So listen, the, the greatest sin, arguably the greatest sin, right? The crucifixion of Christ, right? But he had to go through it. That he did. So he did. That's what I'm about to say. So did God tempt Judas? Because, no. huh? No. The no. no the, the devil was evil. Did God tempt? Did God didn't tempt you. Did God tempt the Jewish leaders? No. Did God tempt Pilate? No. Listen, but was it all still all that evil that God didn't tempt? Was it all still a part of His plan? Yes. Yes. I know why He wanted to do it. Yeah. Uh, all right, Joe. I didn't ask that. All right, it, because He worked it out for the good for those that love Him, even though it was evil. And even though God didn't tempt anybody to do it, God was still sovereign over it. He was in control of it. And it was part of his plan. Has anybody heard the story in the Bible? <coughs> Pardon me. Has anybody heard the story in the Bible, the book of Genesis, about a guy named Joseph? <gasps> yeah. Oh, yeah. Wait. Yeah. Wait. <laughs> wait. Yes. Wait. Yes. Wait. I don't know. Yes. I don't know. Wait. wait. Yeah, wait. No. I know that's two stories. I mean, I know two stories. Alright, I'm talking about somebody said, who said coat of many colors? Somebody me. said that. Ben, that's who I'm talking about. Tell me about this guy. Um, well, he wore a coat of many colors. Yeah. 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 Ye
our coat of many colors, and his yes. brothers got really jealous. And why? Uh, well, and then sold him into slavery, and then he became the king in Egypt. Well, the second in command. Yeah. The second in command. That's pretty. That's pretty good. That was pretty good. That was pretty. Well, he was right under the tree. So hey, Ben. That, that was pretty good, Ben. That was pretty good. So listen. Listen. Did God tempt Joseph's brothers? To no. sell him into slavery? No. Uh, well, no, well, no, well, no. We, we know he doesn't, right? We know he doesn't. Okay. You should take away a point. No. So, but, but, but let's look at this. Let's do a sword drill. Genesis 50. Genesis 50. You guys can find Genesis pretty easily, right? Good. 
This is what comes to their mind. Right? Hey, I understand that. Right? It's easy to think that. But let's see what let, let's see if the context of this can help us figure out what is meant here by good. Okay? So this is verse 28. Let's look at verse 29. Okay. Let's do that as a sword drink. Let's look at Romans 8, 29. Go! Romans Who is making a farting noise? God. For whom he did All right. For whom he or no, he also did. Boy, who's talking over here? Tonight to be conquered. To the right, go ahead, Luke. Say it again. I want everybody to hear. For whom he did foreknow, he also did president to be comfort to the image of his son, son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Of his son. So then what, what, what Luke had just read is, and we know that all things are working together for the good, to them that love God, then we're called according to his purpose, for, or because, ultimately, he wants them to be conformed to the image of his son. So if he's working these things out for the good so that they can be conformed to the image of his son, I would say contextually, the good is a process of being conformed to the image of his son. That's what the good is. Okay? So, maybe like we were talking about last week, we were talking about patience. Maybe, you know, you're going through something that's tough, but maybe it conforms your character to be more patient. And you come through a situation that you wouldn't want to go through, but you come through it having more patience in, in, in the end. Guess what? That worked out for your good. You, you, need, you need to see it that way. Maybe you didn't come out with more money or more power or more pleasure or more comforts, but you came out more conformed into the image of God and the image of His Son. And that's really, that's the best good. Is good what I don't know who said that to you or what they're what they're saying it for, but for your own good. Okay, but I don't know why they're saying that to you. But but the, when it says in this passage, when God is working all things for your good, don't think, well, I, He must have forgot about me because uh, I, you know I, things aren't really turning out so good for me. Realize He's working on your character more than your comfort. That's that's the key. Okay, and if you're the more you're conformed into His image. That, that, that's the ultimate good. That's what he's ultimately interested in. So, and we know that all things, not some things, good and the bad. Usually, probably, he conforms your character more so in bad situations that you would consider bad than good, right? But in all things, he's working together for the good. Um, for, the, for the good. And that's not your comfort. That's to conform you into the image of his son. If you look at contextually to verse 29. And it says... To them that attend to Wana and memorize verses. Right? Is that what it says? No. How did I get that wrong? How did I get that wrong? Hold on. I think I might have messed that up. Oh, right. No, I'm wrong. It says, to them that love God. And, and, and who are called according to his purpose. So it's it's not. It's it's not um it's a specific group of people. It's a, and, and by the way, why do people love God? Let's look that up real quick. Because I think that's, we should, we should know, that's uh, 1 John 9, 1 John 4, 19. I know why people love God. Did I get this because it has my name? Cool. Go. You do. I do? Right there. Because he saved us. We love him because he first loved us. You got it? Oh, Delaney. So listen, <laughs> so listen, the people that love God are the ones that God loved, and by the way, who are the called according to his purpose, and that's not two different groups, this is, this is, it's not this, it's not God's working all things together for the good for two groups, the group that love God, and then the second group that are called according to his purpose, do you realize this is two ways of saying the same group of people? 
You realize that? He's not talking about two separate groups here. To them that love God are the group that he first loved and the group that he called according to his purpose. That's the group, okay? So, and we know that all things work together for the good, not for the people that come to Awana, although I hope you all are in this group. That doesn't necessarily make you a part of this group. It's the group that loved God because he first loved them, and he called them according to his purpose. This verse has been called, and I heard it called this, and I love this verse, the atom bomb or the atomic bomb of peace. Have you guys heard that? No. no. Don't nukes just bring the complete destruction? Yeah, well, that, so it's a complete, it's, it's, it's an explosion of peace. Like we did because, the because if you are in, if you know this verse and you believe it deep down in your heart, then you know no matter what you're going through. No matter what trial you're going through, if you are if you love God, then you're the, then you are one of the ones that were called according to His purpose. Okay, it's the same group. So if you're the one, if you're that person, then listen. No matter what happens to you, the bad, you're gonna be going through a bad situation, but you can have peace in that. Why? Because you know that God's gonna be working all out for your good, and that can bring you peace no matter what you're going through. Even no matter maybe maybe what. Maybe you don't have peace. Maybe I didn't have peace last night watching the election results. But guess what? No matter what happens with that, God's, if, you, if, you, if all things work out together for the good, then the love God is going to work it out for your good. If you're in this group, if you're the group that loves him. So if you're not, if, now ask yourself this for real. Ask yourself this for real because this is important. Are you in the group that love God? You got, you, I can't answer this for you. you got to know. Do you love God? Or, or are you just coming to church maybe to, to, because your parents brought you and so you really had no choice? But I really don't love God. I, if you love God, you want to learn about him, right? You, 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 you want to know more about him. You want to be more like him. You want to absorb what he has to say. You want to praise him. You have affection. Is that, is that, is that why you're here? Or, or you know, because you want, you want to learn more about him? You want to memorize his word? You want to know more? That's the group that loves God. That's the group who are called according to his purpose. If you're here just because your parents dragged you here, or because you think it's fun to hang out with friends, but you have no interest in God, then, then I got a question, are you in this group? And I'm, you question that. I, I, you question that in your own mind. But if you're not in that group, what you need to do is you need to, if you want, if you want to have this peace, because let me tell you, the opposite is true for those that don't love good, let me tell you, everything is going to work out for them. No, everything is going to work out for their bad, ultimately. Ultimately, as bad as it gets. So that's the two groups. And so, if you, if you're not in this group, if you don't love God, then you need to you need to you need to say, God, forgive me. You know what? I don't love you like I should. Forgive me. And Lord, I ask you to call me according to your purpose. I want to be one of your children. I want to love you and I'm because you first loved me. To put that in my heart and forgive me for the bad things I did. Not because I'm so good and I show up to a wannas and I memorize verses. Not because of that, but because your son died for everybody that puts their faith in you and I'm putting my faith in you. And I ask you to forgive me based upon that. And to come into my life and to adopt me as your child and to be my Lord. And if you pray that and if you mean it, guess what? This is your verse. Claim it. And no matter what you're going through, have peace. Because it's all going to work out for your good. So, think about that. All right. We'll leave it there. All right, we're going to go to handbook time now. So why don't, we, why don't we get handbooks? Are you passing out the handbooks? Can I help pass them out? Can I help pass them out?